Welcome, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. I'm Mary Krebs. I'm a family physician, an OAFP board member, and the medical director of primary care at Cohere Health. On behalf of our membership, it is my honor to moderate today's session, how and why to conduct a QI project on breast and cervical cancer in practice. Building on the past two educational sessions, today we'll learn how to take that information and create a quality improvement project to meet the American Board of Family Medicine performance improvement requirements. To provide this education, OAFP has partnered with the Ohio Department of Health. The Ohio Department of Health's Breast and Cervical Cancer Project, BCCP for short, can financially assist eligible Ohioans in obtaining breast and cervical cancer screening and diagnostic procedures. In addition, the BCCP Nav Patients Navigation Program provides guidance in helping patients navigate the healthcare system, find community resources, answers questions about scheduling appointments, using insurance, and more, regardless of eligibility. To make these services available, BCCP partners with approximately 500 physicians and other um, providers in Ohio. To learn more about breast and cervical cancer and the BCCP program, OAFP has offered three continuing medical education webinars free of charge. If you missed our first session, recommended breast and cervical cancer screenings for female and transgendered patients with Dr. Bethany Panchel, Dr. Bethany Panchel um, or our second session, benefit of risk assessments and referrals with Dr. Shilpa Padilla, be sure to check the OAFP website. We are offering enduring CME credit for the archived webinars beginning June 15th. Now for today's session, our speaker is Dr. Ryan Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is the founder of Hickory Medical Direct Primary Care in Bell Fountain, Ohio. He graduated with honors from the Ohio State University College of Medicine and Public Health in 2003 and completed his training at the Riverside Family Medicine Residency Program in Columbus, Ohio. He is well-versed in continuing professional development and certification maintenance um, and frequently contributes to OAFP uh, certification programming. He is the past president he is the past president of the OAFP and currently is alternate delegate to the AFP Congress of Delegates representing Ohio and has also served twice as the delegate. And he's got a great perspective on making things actually doable in practice because I know we all have lack of time and he is really good at finding efficient ways to improve patient care. So in his spare time, he enjoys playing games and sports with his sons, doing home improvement projects, working with computers and playing music. For today's session, Dr. Kaufman will educate attendees on how to analyze their practice, if their practice is doing, how their practice is doing with breast and cervical cancer screening, determine how all team members can facilitate cancer screening, because as docs, we've got so much to do. If we can have somebody else help us, that makes things so much better. Um, instruct on how to choose an intervention that will improve cancer screening rates, and educate attendees on how to create a project that will meet ABFM's practice improvement requirements. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Kaufman, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Hopefully you've been able to participate in our previous webinars discussing recommended breast and cervical cancer screenings and risk assessments and referrals. Today we'll be applying the things you learned in those sessions to help improve the care your patients receive and getting you ABFM certification credit for the work you're doing. For our webinar today, we'll be using a bit of a novel format. This session is pre-recorded. I am participating in the webinar with you and will take questions in the chat during the presentation. Please leave your microphone muted, but type your questions in the chat and I will answer them as we go. After the pre-recorded portion of this presentation, I will be taking questions from the group as well as addressing some of the questions that were asked during the session. I hope that we will find this format to be more engaging and interactive than a standard lecture. It will also give me an opportunity to share a lot more information in the limited time we have today. Let's get started. Today we'll be discussing how and why to conduct a QI project on breast and cervical cancer in practice. I have no conflicts of interest. When you complete this webinar, you'll be able to analyze how your practice is currently doing breast and cervical cancer screening, Determine how all team members can facilitate cancer screening. Choose an intervention for your practice that can improve cancer screening rates. And create a project that will meet your ABFM practice improvement requirements. 
Before we get started, it's important to consider why you should invest time and effort in practice improvement. First, it is important for patients, because patients have better outcome when care is standardized and you have systems in place to make sure that important care is not missed. It can help your practice by improving quality payments from insurance companies. Today, we will focus on the ABFM certification requirements for performance improvement projects. You're required to complete one project as part of each three-year cycle. Today, I will walk you through that process. We will briefly look at the PDSA cycle, which is the basis for the practice improvement process, but it's also the foundation for quality improvement in many other settings. Next, I will show you how you can use process mapping to determine how your practice team is currently functioning. Then you can use it to design improvements to the system your team uses to care for patients. Finally, we will apply these concepts as I show you how you can use the ABFM self-directed clinical pathway to get credit for the changes you're making to improve the care of your patients. We will conclude with a time for questions. Remember that you can ask questions in the chat and I will respond to them throughout this presentation. One easy way to improve the quality of care we provide to our patients is through the use of the PDSA process. PDSA stands for Plan, Do, Study, and Act. The first step is to plan the intervention. This includes a plan of how to collect the data. You will need to propose the idea of the change and determine how it will be tested and then predict what will happen. You need to answer questions of who, what, and when. Who will be involved in the change? This may include physicians, nurse practitioners or physician assistants, front office staff, back office staff, medical assistants, nurses, care managers, or any other staff. What will your intervention be? Make sure that your quality measures are something that is quantifiable. It's best if you can find data that can be collected from your EHR. You need to determine when you can complete the project. You need to plan a reasonable time frame, often starting now and going for a defined period, often three or six months. The next step is do. First, you try the intervention you designed on a small scale. Before you implement the intervention on a larger scale, it is important to see how the intervention works on a limited basis. You want to describe the intervention in as much detail as possible. In this step of the process, you will implement the change, collect data, and then reflect on how the change went. The next step is to study. In this step, you will analyze the data that you have collected. It is important to review any problems or unexpected observations from the intervention. You need to compare your results with your predictions and then determine what you've learned from this process. The final step is to act. You will refine the change based on what you've learned from the test. When you have studied the effect of the intervention, you will decide what changes will be made to your practice due to the results of this intervention. You decide to adopt, adapt, or abandon the changes to your practice. From here, you can start planning the next cycle. Using this PDSA cycle, you'll be able to plan for change and then initiate that change within your practice. Before we get into the details of how to implement a quality improvement project, I'd like to take a moment to talk to you a little bit about choosing appropriate quality measures. The four things I would encourage you to think about as you consider quality measures is making sure that they are clearly defined, clinically significant, meaningful to patients, and easy to measure. First, make sure they are clearly defined. Who what and when are the questions you should be considering in this step. An example of a poor measure is appropriate mammograms. This measure does not define who is involved, it does not define what is appropriate, and it does not define what time period you are looking at. An example of a much better measure would be mammograms in the last two years for women who are aged 50 to 75 years old. Next, the measure should be clinically significant. Does the measure you're considering follow clinical guidelines? For example, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force guidelines or American Academy of Family Physician guidelines. At times it may be appropriate to do a project that deals with patient experience or access issues which have a limited evidence basis for guidelines. However, if you're choosing a clinical topic and you should have some clinical guideline to support your intervention, Otherwise, you may be implementing something that is not actually appropriate for your patients. Also, it's important to make sure the measure you're looking at deals with something you actually see on a regular basis. There's little point in doing a practice improvement project 
for something you do not actually deal with in practice. Finally, it is very reasonable to simplify a measure uh, rather than strictly following something out of a guideline. For example, if you're looking at mammograms, you may choose to look at women who've had mammogram in the last two years for women 50 to 75 rather than last one year. USPSTF guidelines give the recommendation of one to two years for average risk women. It may be much simpler to use the two-year measure because this will be appropriate for all women in your population and this will not force the chart reviewer to make a decision whether the woman is high risk or low risk. If your practice is following American College of Radiology guidelines rather than USPSTF guidelines, it would be appropriate to have uh, the measure of mammograms in the last year for women 50 to 75. Next, your measure should be meaningful to patients. When I consider an intervention or quality measure, I would like to see something that actually improves the clinical outcomes for my patients. It would also be appropriate to have a practice improvement project around something that improves patient experience, whether it's improved access, less wait times, or just their overall experience in the office. Also, it is very useful to do quality improvement projects to look to reduce costs. While increasing charges for services provided may be beneficial for the bottom line, personally I do not feel like these make good uh, quality improvement projects as they actually may lead to worse outcomes for patients and patients avoiding services due to additional charges or may create financial hardship for patients. Therefore, I would consider a practice improvement project to increase charges to the patient at each health maintenance visit to be a poor quality improvement project. Finally, and probably most important, is to have measures that are easy to measure. If you're doing chart review, you should choose measures that can be found at the same spot in the chart for each and every patient. This will greatly reduce the time spent doing chart review. If you have an electronic medical record, and you can obtain the information you want using built-in quality measures, this will be by far the easiest, as you will need no additional knowledge or skills to obtain these reports. However, if you want information that is not already in pre-existing reports, such as MIPS data or insurance measures, you should focus on using discrete data in the chart whenever possible. By using discrete data, you can set up dashboards and easily run reports, thereby eliminating time-consuming chart reviews and allowing you to monitor your data as you go, rather than not knowing your progress until you reach the end of the project and do the final chart review. So in summary, be careful as you choose your quality measures. Taking a little extra time at the beginning may save you a great deal of time as you actually complete this project. Make sure that your quality measures are clearly defined, and be sure that they're clinically significant and meaningful to patients, and make sure that you find a way to make them easy for you to measure. If you follow these tips, I think you will find your quality improvement process goes much more efficiently and is much less frustrating. Quality improvement is a goal for every family medicine office. We all work to improve the care that we give our patients every day. However, in the hectic office environment, it is hard to make much progress if we do not have good tools in place to help us make these changes. Next, you will learn about how you can use process mapping to understand how your practice team is currently providing care, then use this information to improve the quality of care that you provide to your patients. In order to determine how you best make change in your practice, you need to understand how you are doing things now. To be most effective, you should involve representatives for all team members. If you have a small practice like mine, you should probably include the entire practice team in the process. If you have a large practice or a multi-site practice, you should have representatives from each of the roles within the practice. This process will allow your practice to see all the resources that you have available to improve the care you provide to patients. When you are finished with this, you will be able to understand how your practice is currently functioning. By involving other team members in this process, you will see how they play a critical role in the delivery of excellent care to your patients. This process will allow you to discover opportunities to share patient care responsibilities with other members of your team. When you give team members ownership in the care of patients, you can increase the buy-in for all staff members, increase job satisfaction for your employees, and improve the care your patients receive without creating more work for you. This process also creates low-risk opportunity to have your entire team develop ideas of how to improve patient care. Again, every practice will have different people involved, but you should have broad representation from your practice team involved in the process mapping. This should include non-clinical staff members, including front office staff, billing staff, and office managers. You should also include nurses, medical assistants, any mid-level providers, and physicians. 
If you have other staff, such as case managers, laboratory staff, dietitians, mental health providers, or patient educators, you should include them in this process as well. Every practice situation is different. There is no right or wrong way to do this process. While this process works best when the team is there acting face-to-face, -face, it is possible to do this over a virtual platform. When working as a team on process mapping, it is important to consider the power dynamic that takes place in the office. Even in employed situations, physicians' opinion carries significant weight. In private practice situations, where the physician is also the employer, this can magnify this power differential. As physicians, make sure that you are listening to the opinions of staff members before you give your opinion. Because your staff can see things that you do not see, hearing the things that they say can give you new insights into how you can improve the care your patients receive. Make sure that you create a safe environment where your staff feels free to share their insights into how you, as a team, can better care for your patients. You will learn a lot of useful ideas and skills from this process that may change the way that you approach it the next time. While we will be using the example of mammography, this process can be applied to many different clinical situations, including preventative health, screening, vaccination, chronic disease management, and acute care. To do this, you will need a surface to create your map. Generally, this process uses a large paper, but can work with whiteboard or even a table. You will need two colors of sticky notes and markers to write on them. Ideally, you should capture the results on a phone or camera so that you can refer back to this process map later. The first part of developing a process map is to determine the lanes or the individuals or groups that affect patient care within your practice. This will be different for each practice, depending on the resources available to you. For this example, we will include front office, nursing, physician, and patient. The lanes for your practice may look different. In my practice, we do not have any front office staff. Your practice may have other individuals that you can involve in the care of your patients. Depending on the process that you're evaluating, you may want to include outside resources such as specialists and community organizations. Once you've defined your lanes, you will start putting the care process in chronological order. As you go through this process, you can add additional lanes if you discover others that are contributing to the care of your patient. As you work through this process, you may decide to change the starting point of your process, which may create other opportunities to improve the care of your patients. At this point, you are documenting the process as it is currently done. While you will realize changes you may want to make to the system and should make note of them, you should record things as they currently exist. In this example, we will be looking at mammography for breast cancer screening. We will start with the patient calling to schedule an appointment. The front desk will find a time that is open on the physician's schedule and schedule the patient for that appointment. When it is time for that appointment, the patient arrives at the practice. The patient is greeted by the front office staff, is checked in, and their insurance information is updated. Next, the patient is taken to a room by the nurse, vital signs are taken, and the reason for their visit is discussed. Then the physician sees the patient, takes a history, and examines the patient. The physician then recommends mammography when appropriate. What happens next depends on how the patient wants to proceed. The way that this is shown in the process map is to use a different color of sticky note that contains the word fork. The patient may choose to self-refer for a mammogram, or the nurse may refer and schedule the patient for mammography. Next, the patient gets their mammogram. The next step in the process depends on what happens with the result, so place another fork at this point in the process. If the mammogram center returns a result, then the front desk files it to the patient's chart. If the mammogram result is not returned when expected, the nurse will call and request a report. What is nice about using sticky notes is that when you realize you missed something, it is easy to make changes to your process map at any point in this process. As you can see, this process can quickly help you determine how you are currently doing things in your practice. Remember that the rest of your team brings valuable insights into how your practice can improve the care of your patients. Make sure that you hear what other team members have to say. Now that you are finished with your process map, make sure that as a team you discuss what you've learned. Feel free to keep adjusting the map until everyone on the team is satisfied with it. Then take a picture of the final process map so you can refer back to it later if needed. If you have representatives from your practice team involved in the development of your process map rather than the entire team, 
Make sure that you share what you've learned with the rest of the team. Once you've completed your process mapping, there are a number of questions that you need to consider as a team. First of all, you need to consider, is the process that you currently have the most effective process that could be used for the task at hand? Next, you need to consider if there are members of the care team who could contribute in other ways to this process. It's important to consider whether you have the right information at the right time to provide the care a patient needs. Sometimes this could be as simple as assigning a team member to pull information so that it is available at the time the patient is seen. Other times this may require technological changes, such as enabling an interface in your electronic health record to get information from outside sources. It's also important to consider whether the workflow could be simplified. Sometimes things are more complicated than is necessary, and that offers more opportunities for things to fail. As your team evaluates the map, you want to consider what you've learned and whether this can be applied to other processes within the office. Now that you've completed mapping your process, you'll be able to figure out how you want to change your patient care system. Make sure you empower the other members of your team to implement the changes to the system and improve the care your patients receive. Once you've completed this cycle of practice improvement, you should evaluate the results and then start the next cycle of practice improvement. Whenever you make changes in your practice, it is always important to make sure that you consider how these changes will affect health equity. You should consider if the changes you are making are appropriate for all subgroups within your practice. Are there individuals in your practice where these interventions might not work because of language barriers, technology barriers, cost barriers, or issues with access? Are the interventions that you've identified culturally appropriate for the patients you serve? You also need to consider how you can apply population health principles to improve the care your patients receive. What processes extend beyond your practice? How can you partner with other organizations in your community to get resources that will improve the care of your patients? Using process mapping has changed the way that my practice approaches quality improvement. It has given all members of my team a new appreciation for the contribution each person can bring to the care of our patients. It has allowed us to understand the challenges we face in our current system and has allowed us to change our system so that we can provide better care to our patients. I hope you will find this to be as useful in your practice as we have in ours. Finally, we will discuss how you can receive American Board of Family Medicine performance improvement credits for the changes you are making to improve breast and cervical cancer screening for your patients. To maintain our board certification, we are required to do one or two practice improvement projects for each three-year stage. There are many options available for these practice improvement projects. A self-directed clinical pathway allows you to get 20 ABFM points out of the 50 points that you need every three years. While not all PI activities give CME credit, the self-directed clinical pathway gives you 20 CME credits. I want to show you in how as little as one hour you can use the self-directed pathway to get maintenance of certification credit and CME for the work you do on breast and cervical cancer screening. You cannot submit a project until you are finished with it, but you could start it at any point. Your project does not need to be anything complicated. It can be as simple as searching your EHR and finding which patients are due for a mammogram or PAP and then having staff call these patients or having nurses give patient education information and starting the conversation about vaccination for patients who are due for HPV vaccine or making a deliberate effort to link HPV vaccination to the required 7th grade vaccinations. To start, go to the ABFM website at www.theabfm.org. Click on the Physician Login in the right upper corner. Log in using your ABFM number and password. This will bring you to your Physician Portfolio. In the My Requirements area, click on Certification Activities, then click on Performance Improvement. As you can see, my portfolio recommends performance improvement projects based on the information I previously entered about my interests and my practice. Click on the Show Filters button. In the Filter by Keyword field, type Self, and then click Apply Filter. Now you will see the self-directed clinical project. Click on the View Activity button to see the details, then click on the Start button, and that will take you to the form that allows you to submit your project online. As you see, there is a progress bar at the top so you can see how you are doing. Enter a project name. It is fine to use a name such as Cervical Cancer QI Project, but you may use any name you like. Enter your practice name. Click on the area and click on Find an Organization. 
Start typing the name of your organization, then select it from the list, or click on the Create an Organization button at the bottom. Your name, email address, and ABFM number have already been entered. If you are doing this project, then you should select Yes for the question, Do you have a direct continuing care responsibilities for family medicine patients? In this case, you are doing this project on your own with your own data, so select No for boxes 1 and 2. Next, you select the beginning date for the project and the completion date for the project. As you have not yet completed your project, you will enter your information and then save it and submit it at a later date once your data has been collected. In box 5, select how your project was funded. Select internally if you did not get any funding for this project. Next, you will need to select a topic area for your project. In box 6, select the relevant topics for this project. In this example, I would use child and adolescent health, cancer, immunizations, vaccines, preventative care, and teamwork. In box 7, you need to type your description of the problem that you are trying to solve. One or two sentences is fine. For this example project, I will use too many young women are not getting their HPV vaccination and are at increased risk for cervical dysplasia and cancer. In box 8, enter your aim for this project. Make sure there is a clear goal, generally including numbers in a specific time frame. In box 9, you'll be entering the details for your measure. This should come from your goal. You need to enter the name of the measure that you're working to prove, the goal, the number of records, then your baseline, and follow-up data. For the number of charts, generally you want to include at least 10 charts if you're doing chart review to obtain data. However, if you're able to pull the data for your entire population using the reporting function or EHR, you will have data that gives a more complete idea of how you're really doing in your practice. For box 10, you type a couple of sentences describing the intervention you made. For this sample intervention, the description might look something like this. We discussed the importance of HPV vaccination and current vaccination guidelines at a whole office meeting. When a nurse roomed a patient for a teen well visit, they discussed all vaccinations due, including HPV vaccination. We specifically added discussion of HPV vaccination to our well adolescent visit template to make sure that we document vaccine recommendations. The rest of the form is to attest that you were involved in the project. You do not need to be the one doing all aspects of the project in order to receive credit. Next, there is a survey about your experience in doing this PI project. At the bottom of the form, you must attest that all questions and fields have been completed fully and truthfully. Each section of the form saves as you complete it, so if you want to finish it later, you can close it out at any point. When you are finished, click the Submit button. Soon after you submit it, you should receive an email that confirms that you have completed your project. If you have any issues with this process, the ABFM is available to help. There is support on the website, or you can use the live chat function. Again, the website is www.theabfm.org. From 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time during the week, and from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday, the ABFM Support Center can be reached at 1-877-223-7422. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Absolutely. So we've got some questions for you. 
So the first one is what is a reasonable goal a practice should shoot for for cancer screenings? There's going to be patients who will be non-compliant no matter what your process is. Absolutely true. Sure, that's always one of the most frustrating parts of all this is uh, working so hard and then seeing that sometimes it doesn't uh, doesn't get all the way there. So there's a couple of ways to approach this. Um, one way to approach this, and probably what I'd recommend when you're first starting out working on a project like this, is first of all, start by making sure that you're actually making a recommendation to every patient. So there's two ways to look at it. One is, are you making the recommendation? The other is the patient actually completing it. And depending on your patient population, you may be doing a very, very good job of making a recommendation and finances and their social situation or um for example, with certain things around here with COVID, immunizations became a real challenge because the health department is no longer giving immunizations. You know, and so if you had a quality measure that looked at the numbers given, it would, would have looked pretty bad last year. So um, what you might do is you might start off or look at both numbers, look at both, making sure you have recommendations because if you're not making the recommendation, your patients aren't gonna be getting it. So, so you can start off saying, hey, we wanna have, make sure that we are hitting 95% documented recommendation for appropriate screening. Um, and then you can also look at, okay, what's the end result? Because that is really what we're trying to do is get that good result for our patients in the end. Um, and so there's a couple of ways to get that good idea of, of a target. One thing to look at is look what your local community numbers are if you have access to those. If you're part of a physician group, um, uh, part of a hospital group or something like that, most likely they're going to be tracking those things. So that's a nice comparison. Look at national comparison numbers. Um, uh, the Department of Health keeps track of kind of screening rates for everybody in the state of Ohio. Um, you always want to be above average. So, you know, if you're below average, aiming for that average number to start and then aiming for that higher number and higher number. Um, whatever you do, uh, unless you are truly amazing, um, you're not going to get the 100% on your first try. Um, but hopefully what you'll do is you'll learn something, you'll get some good ideas, and then you'll turn around and do it again and be able to get further improvements. And so, so what you really want to do is see where you're at. And it's great to kind of um, get that initial number and then aim to improve it by 10%, 15%. The other thing to remember is, is it really depends on your timeline. If you're gonna do a project for a year, that number better look a whole lot better. If you're doing a project that only goes for three months, obviously you're not gonna reach most of your patients in that time period. And so, so if you're doing something where you're seeing them for health maintenance once a year, if you get even a five or a 10% improvement over a three month intervention, that's really pretty good. And so, so it really kind of depends on, on what numbers you're looking at and how you choose to do it. The key is not, e what I've, what I've always found when I do these projects is, yes, the numbers improve. If you do it right, the numbers will improve over time, most of the time. Um, but it's the changes you make that are the most important part, because a lot of these numbers, um, you know, with breast and cervical cancer, we have a little shorter time periods we're looking at. Um, but with something like colorectal cancer, it takes years sometimes to get those numbers up. Um, and that's okay, because you're asking the questions, you're starting to get things out there, and you're putting those systems in place. And what's so valuable about doing something like this is even if your project, you choose to focus on breast cancer, what you're going to find is the things that you do for breast cancer are going to improve your numbers for colorectal cancer and going to improve your numbers for all these other things that are so important that we're doing with our patients. And so, so the, the important part of this process is not what the number is, because whether it's the ABFM you're talking about or whether it's your own learning, uh, you get credit whether it goes up or not. I've had people who, who go and do a project and their, their number at the end actually is lower. Now, do I think they're actually screening less? No, I don't. But it's if you're reviewing 10 charts, um, we've all done this when we look at diabetes quality. It all depends on the 10 charts you have. Uh, and all it takes is one patient to raise your entire A1C average by a point or two. Um, it's amazing what 14 will do. Um, and so, so sometimes that number isn't the most important thing. It, for each individual, it's very, very important they get that recommendation. Um, but especially just doing a chart review, what's important is the process. Don't worry too much about the number. Choose something and aim for it. But if you don't get it, still embrace what you've learned and then take that to improve further the next time. Thanks, Dr. Kaufman. I, I fully agree. I think, yeah, looking at if you've got other partners or other practices in your area that you've got that data or in your system, that's great. If not, look at, you know, what is the Ohio average? What is the national average and look at where you're at and how long of a time period you're looking at and adjust. And, you know, you might not, you're right. You might not get it where you want it, but you, you're making progress. You know, family medicine is a marathon, not a sprint. So, um, next question is you started talking about breast cancer screening and then cervical cancer screening is being used for the ABFM template reporting. 
we only have to use one metric such as breast cancer screening or cervical cancer screening, not both, correct? That is absolutely correct. Um, what we did was we just chose kind of some representative samples um, and you, uh, basically, uh, you know how it is, you don't want everybody to do exactly the same thing. So I wanted to give uh, whichever you decide to do some ideas of good ways to get there. But no, you wanna apply for one thing, um, recognizing that you will improve all the things when you're working on it, but no, focus on one small area. So if you want to say, hey, I want to work on breast cancer screening, do just breast cancer screening. Recognizing, of course, if part of your process is you want to make sure you're getting those women in for those regular health maintenance visits, uh, I sure hope you're going to think about cervical cancer when you see them uh, and you're making those breast cancer recommendations as well. But, but for quality improvement, focus on one measure. And like I said uh, at the front, choose something that's very, very easy for you to find. Um, and actually, fortunately, both mammograms and PAP should be pretty easy to find in most people's charts. Um, but if you have a system that tracks one better than the other, I'd go with whatever, you, whatever it's easier for you to track. Because if you review 10 charts, it will tell you about those 10 charts. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I'm reviewing charts and I get one and my numbers don't look as good as they thought, I always have a good excuse for why that was a bad selection of patients. Um, when you take them all, it's really hard to explain that away. Uh, it gives you a much better number and a much better feel. And the um, both the exciting part of quality improvement and kind of the depressing part of quality improvement is we always like to think we're doing a great job. And the truth of the matter is, is usually I'm doing a great job for that patient who's in front of me for that thing. Um, if, if you come in uh, as a woman, you come into me, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, if you're coming for your health maintenance visit, I'm going to do a great job of talking to you about breast cancer screening and cervical cancer screening. If you're a woman the same age who comes in very rarely and comes in on a busy day uh, to talk about uh, the cold they have, I'm not sure I'm going to do quite as well. And, um, and so, so the beautiful thing about using that, th those measures you can get out of your record is if you can look at it for your whole population, it'll give you a much, much better feel of how you're really doing on things. Not like a chart review. If you randomly pick people where you may pick people you haven't seen in a year or two, um, or if you just pick the people you saw for health maintenance, you'll skew what, what your numbers actually look like. That's a great point. And yeah, well, we're all, we all know what we need to do. The, the difference between knowing that and doing it, you know, you're right on a busy day when the patient comes in once a year and they've got a sprained ankle and, um, oh, and I wanted you to check this small and, oh, by the way, I'm depressed, you know, like, honestly, I don't think much, many of us are nearly as good about like, Hey, what about your pap smear right then? Um, I'm sure some of you are, and that's awesome. Um, but it's hard. And you're right. We, we think of ourselves on our best days. And sometimes we have those days where things are, are kind of hitting the fan. So, um, next question is how often will a managed care program such as Medicare or Medicaid pay for a PAP or a mammogram in an average risk patient? So, um, I'm probably not the best person to field this question because I don't take insurance of any type. Um, but I certainly do have patients who have, have these insurance programs. So uh, Medicaid actually covers uh, these things great. Uh, I've never had a problem with a patient uh, doing either yearly for either PAP or for mammogram. I've never seen a problem with that. And uh, I would guess with Medicaid, you could probably send in PAPs more than once a year uh, and not get into trouble with it. Um, I mean, certainly with the abnormals in the past, I've never had a problem with somebody um, getting in. The rest of it is you know, with Medicaid, uh, with labs, uh, they really kind of can't refuse them. Um, and so, so I don't think that's gonna be a problem. With Medicare, um, Medicare is always a little more dicey. Um, and I couldn't speak on the, on the mammograms yearly with Medicare has never been a problem for anybody. If you try to do them more than once a year, that will be, will be a problem. Um, and with PAPs, I believe you could still get away with yearly, but I couldn't say that for sure. I don't know if you have any more recent experience with that, Mary. Um, so I would uh, like on, um, mammograms agree and year I've never had a problem with Medicare or Medicaid. Um, and with Medicaid, even though like I'm following the PAP guidance, obviously average risk patients. So three, you know, I would do it co-testing at three or I'm sorry, I would do, you know, let's say three years. Um, if sometimes you see, you know, the patient says, oh, I haven't had it. And then, oh, it was like, you know, really only two years ago. Um, and, and, but I've never had a problem with that. The only time I've ever had a problem is sometimes with Medicare and how frequently a PAP is there. Um, but that was also, I don't think I've had a problem since the guidelines changed. You know, I mean, I was having, there were pe people who like, I want my yearly PAP. And I, back in the, you know, at the time when that was a thing, you know, it'd be like, okay, Medicare might not pay for this, but I have not had, if you're, if for average risk, I've not had any problems, um, 
particularly if you're at all close to the guidelines. Um, next question is, why is quality improvement important? So as I think about quality improvement, there are several places important. Obviously, it, as patients, it's easy to see why it's important. You want, uh, you want to be seeing a doctor who is looking at how they do um, and looking to do better. Um, so that, that part's easy from a patient standpoint. Uh, from a physician standpoint, why is it important? Well, um, you know, uh, through this quality improvement process, like we talked about with process mapping, this is something that I've been doing for more than a decade now with staff. And um, it is... It, it changes the way you approach your, your work um, because this is really an opportunity to interact with staff, get to know staff, and get let staff have uh, more input and uh, more responsibility in the care of patients. Um, uh, it was doing something through the academy. The first time I, I did this process and I sat down and we were talking about things with uh, one of our front desk people. And, I, and to hear kind of their view of of what their job looks like. It, you know, it frankly hadn't ever occurred to me. I certainly talked to our front office people regularly, talked to them about what was going on, knew them as people, but it hadn't ever really taken the time to sit down and think about, okay, what, how, what's their view of patient care? What does this look like to them? And how can they make the care of my patients better? Um, and so, so it's really kind of an exciting way to do that. Um, so that, uh, that's one huge advantage as a physician to do quality improvement. Um, also, uh, there's always a financial incentive. Uh, more and more programs are paying for quality, which just makes sense. And if you're getting paid by quality, uh, doing a practice improvement project, you may invest a very small amount of time. And in return for that, you may get an incredible amount more money back. So that, that's a great reason uh, to, uh, to take the time and do quality improvement projects. Um, and so, so, yeah, so it's better care for patients. It is um, a kind of better, better support from staff uh, and, uh, and improve job satisfaction for staff uh, as, well, as well as making my, my job easier. Uh, and then finally getting paid more for what we're doing anyway and what we wanna be doing. Thanks for that. Um, what are good ways to learn about a topic you may want to focus on for a quality improvement project? So um, when I'm thinking about, okay, what, how, what am I gonna work on next? Um, there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as having, having a patient um, where you go, oh, I wish we had done a better job of looking at this or, you know, how could we improve that care? And so that'll drive it. Um, but a great way to do it is if you have something to learn about anyway. So for example, um, if you're doing a knowledge self-assessment for your, uh, uh, for your maintenance certification, uh, it's a great way to, to learn more about a topic and go, oh, there are a few things that have changed since I did medical school and uh, maybe I should be doing a couple things differently. Uh, and so that's a great way to kind of um, see what those guidelines are and, um, and learn about a topic and then turn around and do a practice improvement uh, thing on the same topic. So that's a great way to do it. Um, another great way to do it is as you're reading about new guidelines that come out um, of looking and seeing, okay, what's the new guideline on blood pressure or the new guideline on diabetes or the, uh, the, the new guideline on uh, COPD. Uh, and then as you re are reading the guidelines, uh, almost certainly in those big guidelines, you'll find something that you probably haven't been doing the way they wanna do it now. Um, and so it's a great opportunity there to look at, look at what you are doing and then how you can get closer to the, meeting those guideline standards. Um, and so those are both uh, really, really good ways um, to, to uh, figure out what projects you want to do, and then learn that thing, those things behind it, because um, it is, it's incredibly important to tie these things to something. Uh, what you don't want to do is just go kind of randomly choosing something that seems like a good idea, and then get partway through it and discover, well, no, that was just always kind of what I did, not something that had any good evidence basis behind it, because you're not really improving quality if you're not actually aiming for something that you should be aiming for. Um, and so, so finding something like that to ground it is a great way to do it. All right, um, another question is, if you have a med medical student rotating with you, how do you involve them with the, in a quality improvement project? <clears throat> so um, QI is a great way when you have uh, some extra capacity in your practice. Um, whether it's a medical student or uh, right now, uh, I uh, just had a nurse practitioner start with me recently and she's still working on building a patient base. Um, and so we have some extra time there and has some extra nursing time as well. And so 
uh, if you have a student, the way to do it is uh, when you find something's kind of an interesting, interesting topic, you say, hey, why don't you read some about this topic? And then let's talk about something that you see that we could work on. Um, and the, the beautiful thing is, uh, if you have a student working with you, they'll love a topic like this. Um, they are, uh, most of them hopefully are a little more up to date on some of the guidelines than we are simply because they've just learned it. Whereas we may have learned a little bit and trying to learn it as, and learn the updates as we go. Um, and so it's a great op opportunity to kind of talk, talk together, to learn from each other, and then to let the student really do the heavy lifting and to be able to, once you've talked about with them kind of what their vision is for it, um, you can have them educate uh, nursing uh, or MAs on how to do that. So for example, a number of years back, we did a uh, quality improvement project on uh, around hypertension. And one of the big things we started off talking about was how to actually measure blood pressure correctly. And it is amazing how many people don't know how to do it. Um, and and so, so as part of that, we did a video and to say, okay, you uh, go and show this video and then go over with the nurses and practice taking blood pressures and making sure that they're actually taking them correctly. Um, and they can, they can do that work for you. And then the student can collect your data for you. Uh, the beautiful thing of the, of the way the certification project uh, certification works is you don't have to do all parts of the project. So if you are helping to oversee, they can do the education, the data collection, uh, leaving you with um, credit and CME credit without having to invest a huge amount of time. So it's a great way to um, give, uh, give a student some ownership in a project uh, to give them something to do that's exciting and interesting. And at the same time, do something that's gonna save you time, that's gonna improve the care of your patients. And, um, and also, um, you know, frankly, sometimes in a busy day, it gives you a little bit of space to have that student doing something that doesn't involve you having to be involved. And so it, or in every second of it. So, so it's a great way to, to do a quality improvement project. Those are some great ideas, uh, Dr. Kaufman. One of the things that I sometimes, I think is great for a med student to see is that, you know, they're all excited and they know the guidelines and they think everybody's gonna get it. And, um, and so I think sometimes one, letting them initially watch me counsel people about mammogram and getting that some of that pushback. And then sometimes even letting them do it with, when I have a nice patient, you know, um, letting them do it while I'm in the room and tell them, hey, you know, I know you're gonna ask questions about their sinus infection, and their diabetes, but I also want to make sure you ask about their mammogram, you know, and so letting them do some of that. And also if you are busy doing, you know, I'll often send my med student in a room and I'll see somebody, see one, they'll see one and then I'll join. And, but they, that can spend, you know, they might be able to already come and say, Hey, I've already talked to this patient about a mammogram. They're going to do it. Great. Good job. And if they're not, I often find that the second person who says something really makes a difference. Like how many times have has, you know, my MA come out and been like, they won't get a flu shot. And I go in and I talk to him and they're not that hard to convince. And then the, I come out and I'm telling my MA like, Hey, they need a flu shot. And they're like, but, but they told me no, like why? And I'm like, cause I'm the second person. Like you screwed, you got that lid a little bit, a little bit loose and I twisted it the rest of the way, you know? And so I think sometimes just having somebody else bring it up and then you bring it up again. Sometimes that actually makes a big difference in my experience. And I think uh, the other thing that's really nice about it is um, it, medical students are always so wonderful and idealistic, and that's why they're so much fun to work with. It's also good for them to see the challenges of real world medicine, um, and uh, especially those who will go on to be uh, subspecialists. Uh, it's always interesting to hear the way they look at the way that we do care um, it, without a, always that appreciation for how complicated it is on the ground and all those other factors that come into play. And so, no, I think it's, it's a great way for students to see both the, the good things, the opportunities for change, but also what some of those real barriers are for change. Because um, so many times insurance companies take this totally unrealistic view of what we can achieve, um, you know, and back to that question of, okay, what's a reasonable goal is sometimes what we can achieve is educating the patient, moving them a step closer. Um, but it may not be that hundred percent, you can make hundred percent of the recommendations. It won't mean hundred percent of people do the test. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Copper, would you tell us about the um, uh, care of women K KSA that's coming? Sure. Um, so ABFM has had, um, has uh, had several uh, KSAs around women's health types of issues. Uh, there was formerly a women's health uh, KSA as well as maternity care. 
Um, and as part of their revision on the knowledge self-assessments uh, coming out supposedly in June, so coming up, up here in the next month or so, uh, it may be delayed a little bit, but it should be at this summer, there will be a new uh, KSA entitled Care of Women. And um, what they're doing is they're going through and uh, revising all the questions, updating them. Um, I know for folks who've done some of the older KSAs, it's pretty frustrating because some of the, um, uh, some of the articles they reference aren't the most up-to-date, um, but all the questions are gonna be rewritten. Um, and uh, all the questions are now changing over uh, for those of you who've done the revised ones uh, from the old format, which was select some of these correct answers uh, to the much better select the one best answer format. So um, much, much better learning experience uh, and, um, and, and a great opportunity. And the, the new KSA on care of women is coming out here in the next month or so. So if you're looking uh, over the summer here of implementing a project to improve women's health, I'd highly recommend taking that KSA. Um, because that will give you some of the knowledge basis. It will hit on some of those important points um, and may give you some other ideas of ways to, to approach uh, some, of, some of these discussions um, and just give you some more good background information in a way that also gives you uh, CME credit and uh, helps you uh, get your uh, maintenance certification. So I uh, highly recommend that one. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but they're taking the best questions out of the women's health, along with some of the best questions out of the maternity care, putting it together, uh, and uh, turning into care of women. So watch for that in the next month or so. Thanks. So another question, what is the most challenging part of quality improvement and how do you deal with that? That's a very good question. Um, you know, so I think um, the most important part is, is looking for the right measures. Um, it's not necessarily the most challenging, but it's most important that if you choose measures that are sometimes the the best measure clinically is impossible to obtain or almost impossible to obtain. And you will spend hours looking through charts. Um, and so what you want to find is something that's good enough um, that, that is actually going to make a difference for patients, uh, but easy enough you can get it quickly. Um, I think the hardest part is, um, is really getting the buy-in for the change um, because, you know, if, if you were changing to something where just playing easier, uh, you wouldn't have to make that change. Um, and so it's going to mean more work for somebody. And uh, hopefully you will find ways that it doesn't mean a whole lot more work for you. Uh, because uh, I don't know about, uh, about most of you, but uh, most, most people I know uh, already have enough to do in their day um, and aren't looking for something new. And so if you find ways that you can uh, get your other staff members, whether it's the front office staff, whether it is um, your MA or your nurse, uh, to start asking some of these questions, like Mary said, kind of priming that pump so that when you have the discussion, they already have a lot of the data they need and you're just kind of helping reinforce, move things along. Um, uh, if you can find ways to do that, uh, that's the thing. But um, the rest of your staff is also pretty busy, you know? And so, so it's always finding that, showing the value uh, because uh, hopefully everybody in your office is really there to make better care for your patients. So if you can show them, connect the dots, between this task that means one more thing they have to do in their day and how it actually makes something better for patients. That's huge. And what I find is the more you involve, the more you involve your other staff in the care of patients, the more they see that direct connection there and the more happy they are to do it. Because the thing of it is, is you and I know how that is. We have those patients where we've gone way beyond what's reasonable because it's for that patient and you know, it's going to make a difference. And, you know, and when, when all they see is that demanding patient on the phone yet again, you know, they don't want to do it. But when they say, oh no, this is going to make a difference. This is why this patient is still here to see their grandkids is because of something we did. That's worth the effort. And so, so the more you can do that, um, the, the more that you do, the more successful it's going to be. But that takes time, uh, that takes investment, and that takes uh, you being the leader out there and, and making sure that, that the rest of the staff is buying into this process. And, and part of that buy-in is that being willing to let go of things a little bit, you know, and to hear what other people have to say and to listen to what other people have to say, because it's always the first time you do that and you, you let somebody else suggest what you should do, it, it feels a little dangerous because as physicians, we like to be in control. We like to know where things are headed. We like to do all those things. And to make this work well, sometimes you have to, to let somebody else suggest something and Sometimes you have to go with something even if it's not the way you would do it. And so, so that, that's probably, the, at least personally, what I found to be the hardest part of this, but it's also what makes it the most rewarding. And so, so yeah, so I think it's a great process. And uh, 
I encourage you to try it. Great points, Dr. Kaufman. One of the things I would really try to make sure I'm doing is including when I'm celebrating successes, making sure I'm acknowledging the staff who played a part. So if, if Mrs. Jones never wants to get her mammogram and my front desk person had a nice chat with Mrs. Jones and she gets her, about her mammogram and she gets that mammogram, I'm like high five in Mrs. or high five in my front desk person and letting them know, hey, way to go. That made a huge difference. And then the next time I want to do some QI project, they're far more likely to go along with it. <laughs> So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and likewise, um, it's not just that it's when you go, okay, here's something we caught because we're doing a better job of this. If we hadn't caught this, here's where we could end up at. It's huge. Ab and it makes all Absolutely. The well, thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. Um, and thank you everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the session on behalf of the Academy's leadership and staff. We hope that you, we've provided valuable education. Thank you for all that you do to advance health in your communities. Keep up the passion and dedicated work. Thank you very much.